The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Imagine that you're an English orchestration professor teaching at university in the 1920s. The chief orchestration text available to you would be Cecil Forsyth's monumental collection of advice and wit, simply titled Orchestration. You may even have studied this in your classes. Now Professor Forsyth is in America, and you're the new virtuoso orchestration teacher. What kind of a course would you teach? What salient points would you want to underline that are already made in Forsyth's book? What deficiencies of his would you want to remedy? Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor Thomas Goss, bringing you another installment of the Orchestration Book Club. This is actually the 100th video I've produced for the Orchestration Online channel, so it's only fitting that I cover a classic text on orchestration for my viewers, just as in my first two videos. This time, it's my great pleasure to bring you Orchestral Technique by the English composer and orchestration teacher, Gordon Jacob. Jacob started his teaching career with the Royal College of Music at the fairly precocious age of 29 and remained there for over 40 years. When he started teaching in 1924, he faced the challenge of building his own course curriculum from a series of books that had no course structure. The great orchestration tomes available at the time were extensive treatises, like Forsyth's Orchestration and Berlioz's Grand Treatise on Instrumentation. Both of those books are informative, well-written, engaging, and sprawling. They contain whole worlds of experience, and tend to have many distracting and unnecessary passages, at least for a student whose attention must be focused on certain essentials if they're to pass a course. Berlioz spends pages speculating about armies of musicians, and building his perfect orchestra of the future from instruments that are rare or obsolete today. Forsyth spills rivers of ink over instruments that he well knew were of little significance for future orchestrators, like the Heckelklarind, Jacob's solution was ingenious, and the proof of this is in the longevity of his 1931 book, Orchestral Technique. It survived several generations of university instruction, and is still published today by Oxford University Press. It's not a treatise, nor is it a self-contained university text. Rather, it's a curriculum. Subtitled A Manual for Students, it's more properly a series of notes and assignments around which an orchestration teacher can structure a course. This strategy treats books like Forsyth's orchestration as secondary resources, the information from which is distilled to its most concise essence in each chapter of Jacob's book. The teacher may build from this a series of lectures on each instrument, or each section of instruments, but this book isn't about the minutiae of instrumentation, Rather, it's about developing some ground rules for a solid approach to orchestral arranging. Many of Gordon Jacobs' points are illustrated in his own orchestrations of well-known piano music by great composers, showing how to directly apply his training. Each chapter is completed by suggested scoring assignments so the student can get to the work of arranging for themselves. If you've been following the Orchestration Book Club since I began, you'll recall my video about William Lovelock's Elements of Orchestral Arranging, which was written as an update of the Gordon Jacob. In my opinion, Lovelock takes things a bit further than Jacob's model, with more detailed examples, more comprehensive writing, and far more extensive and useful assignments. But this speaks of a lifetime of Lovelock using Jacob's text and customizing its approach with his own ideas and improvements. It's only natural that Lovelock should attempt a progression of Jacob's approach, and tie it more closely to his own training methods in inner hearing. I'll read a few passages for you now, and you'll see how resonant Jacob's advice is with Lovelock's, and yet far more concise and to the point. Perhaps that's better in a way. More said with fewer words in a textbook gives an instructor more freedom to personalize their coursework. From Chapter 1, the introductory. The following are some of the qualifications which the would-be orchestrator should strive to acquire. 
Number one, a good oral imagination. Without the ability to call up to the mind's ear the sound of an orchestral passage from a perusal of the score, all his work will be experimental and unconvincing. Some persons possess this power naturally far more than others, but it can be acquired, like most other things, by means of hard and persistent mental concentration. The first step in the acquisition of this power is to study minutely the scores of works immediately after hearing them, while the oral memory of them is fresh. If this method is seriously pursued, and it demands unremitting attention, at concerts and very close study afterwards, it will not be long before the printed score of an unheard work will begin to express itself in actual sound to the mental ear. It is not sufficient alone to follow the score while listening, though it is good to do this, since the music moves on too fast for the eye to take in all the details. The score must be closely studied at leisure after the performance, whether followed during it or not. Number two, practical common sense. Show this by always making your intentions clear in your scores by means of carefully thought out dynamic markings, bowing of string parts and phrasing of wind, by writing comfortably for your players and avoiding the strain and irritation caused by constant high notes, awkward passages, and too infrequent rests for the wind instruments, by avoiding remote keys, loathed by strings and winds alike. In making orchestral arrangements of music written in remote keys, transpose a semitone up or down according to whether the piece is brilliant or the reverse. Do not imagine that attention to practical details argues a defective artistic sense. Leave such ideas to romantically minded novelists. To musicians, music is not only an art, it is also a craft, and a complex and difficult one. Number three, a clear and well-ordered style. Clarity should be one of the chief ideals of the orchestrator. The texture of the music which you are scoring, whether your own or that of another composer, must be analyzed into its component parts, each of which must be carefully balanced or contrasted with the others. Lack of clearness is generally due to a lack of comprehension of the true implications of the music. For example, in transcribing pianoforte music, the effect of the sustaining pedal is often not taken into account, the harmonic scheme being thus misinterpreted. Number four, a mind alert for points of interest. Seize on any points of interest and bring them out in your score, but do not overload it with detail to the extent of fussiness and to the detriment of the main body of the music. Orchestration is a coloristic and decorative art, but the ear should be intrigued, not distracted by the play of color. If there's too much going on all the time, it will be impossible to make the highlights or peak points stand out sufficiently from the rest. At the same time, monotony and boredom must be strictly guarded against. Almost all else can be forgiven, but boredom never. Number five, showmanship and a sense of the dramatic. Do not be afraid of being effective, but shun effect merely for effect's sake. Whatever the mood of the piece you are scoring, your orchestration should emphasize and enhance it. This is the true meaning of effectiveness, or of putting it over, as they say in the theater. The abuse of effect shows itself when inappropriate means are used to simply show off one's imagined skill and knowledge of the orchestra. In such cases, orchestration descends to the level of a conjuring trick, which depends for its effect on a series of shocks and surprises. The object of orchestration is not to show how clever one is. That is of no interest to anyone but to present the music in its clearest and most appropriate orchestral form. From here, Jacobs introduces each section of the orchestra progressively for the course building instructor. First strings, then a couple of chapters on winds and horns, then the small orchestra followed by the brass, and so on. Along the way, Jacob presents the reader with ever more intense challenges to their developing craft from coloristic concerns to more sweeping arrangements to fiendishly tricky assignments in using the least amount of harp pedal changes.
I don't agree with all of Jacob's advice. His pronouncements on orchestral balance and doubling are somewhat subjective, and don't open the door on advances in musical style past his own late romantic slash pastoralist leanings. But most of his concluding general remarks are solid advice for the developing orchestrator. Number one, avoid the sectional effect produced by constantly using contrasted groups of instruments in turn. For example, a section of strings alone followed by one for woodwinds alone, and then one for brass, and then strings alone again. This may occasionally be done if the character of the music demands it. But generally speaking, a blending or fusion of the various groups with one another makes for continuity and homogeneity. The music never seems to get going when this is indulged in excess. Number two, avoid thickness. This is caused by too low and grumpy placing of the harmony. Open harmonic spacing is desirable in the lower registers of the orchestra. It may also be caused by the desire to give some instrument or group of instruments something to do. Do not have instruments meandering pointlessly about in the score. They obscure the outlines of the music, and if not required to give point or weight to some part of the texture, they had far better be given rests. Number three, avoid thinness. This has been insisted upon throughout the book. Wide spaces between the bass and the next part above it should only be allowed as a special and calculated effect. Holding notes on a single horn are often sufficient to fill such gaps and give stability and body to the structure. Number four, do not regard the brass and drums solely as noisemakers. They may frequently be used with pianissimo for excellent effect. Number five, do not keep your horns going all the time. There's a great tendency amongst beginners to do this. A warm wad of horns is bound to prevent thinness in the middle octaves of the orchestra, but their continuous use palls on the ear and tires the players. Number six, reserve extreme high notes on woodwind and brass for triple forte climaxes, and be sparing of them even then. Number seven, remember that the strings are the foundation of the orchestra and do not be afraid to use them alone for quite long passages if you wish to do so. The ear does not quickly tire of string tone, which is the most beautiful and variable of all orchestral sounds. In quiet passages, use divisi rather than double stops. In passages of a more forceful nature, double stops are often desirable, especially in the second violins and violas. Make sure that they are easy to play. It's interesting to compare this book, along with the Berlioz and the Forsyth, with Piston's orchestration. I feel that Piston really synthesized much of the approach of all of these books into one text, possibly the first comprehensive English language university orchestration text, with instrumentation, examples, assignments, and basic scoring advice. Of course, the period in which Piston composed may have limited the amount of scoring examples he was willing to score himself, as it was a time of enormous experimentation and variation of approach between composers. University professors might well reflect that variety in their own instruction, so it would perhaps have been better to underline the fundamentals and leave the instruction on arranging to them. But it does sacrifice the hands-on approach of Gordon Jacob and William Lovelock. With them, you feel mentored. With Piston, at the most you feel instructed, as in a classroom. The Orchestration Book Club will take a break during the first term of the massive open online orchestration course. But before it does, We'll look over the charming biography of a great virtuoso violinist and conductor. Now go read something. <laughs>